tomorrow's show. So I shall return very quickly. Double layers in laboratory in cosmic plasmas. The Helicon Double Layer Thruster, HDLT, credit Australian National University Research, School of Physical Sciences and Engineering. Electric double layers are like waterfalls that energize charged particles falling through them. We have to learn again that science without contact with experiments is an enterprise which is likely to go completely astray into imaginary conjecture. Hans Elfie. A double layer forms in plasma when electric charge flows through it. Double layers are found in the plasma environment of Earth, as well as around the stars, creating phenomena like aurorae and electromagnetic radiation from pulsars, thermal emissions from hot filaments in light bulbs, LED plasma, lead plasma pioneer Irving Langmuir, to contemplate that the behavior of charged particles moving through various gases. He was the first to coin the term plasma when referring to such ionized gas. Since charged regions in gas tend to isolate themselves from the environment, as well as act in ways not governed by mechanical theories, he thought they appeared similar to the organic plasma component of cells. So he used biology-based terminology. I don't think it's way off base either. There might even be something to that mimicking cells with the living cell galaxy theory. It's pretty interesting. Scientists from the National University Research School of Physical Sciences and Engineering in Canberra discovered double layers in their laboratory plasma systems, finding that they were accelerating eons to supersonic velocities. The double layers are self-generating, so the effect has been incorporated into an efficient spacecraft thrust mechanism. As mentioned, a double layer is an electric charge separation region that forms in plasma. It consists of two oppositely charged parallel layers resulting in a voltage drop in electric field across the layer, which accelerates the plasma's electrons and positive ions in opposite directions. Since moving electric charges generate electricity, there is an electric current present. If there are sufficiently large potential drops in layer separation, electrons might accelerate to relativistic velocity producing synchrotron radiation. Nobel Prize winner Hans Elfane described a double layer as a plasma formation by which a plasma, in the physical meaning of this word, protects itself from the environment. And it's analogous to a cell wall by which plasma, in the biological meaning of this word, protects itself from the environment. Isn't that interesting? Just about everything has some kind of self-protection mechanism. Electric forces can accelerate charged particles with energies of 10 to the power of 20 electron volts or more. Since electricity requires a circuit for charge to flow, and an electric current forms a magnetic field. That field tends to constrict the current. As pointed out in previous Picture of the Day articles, that constricted channel is known as a Bennett pinch, or Z-pinch. The pinched filaments of electric current remain coherent over large distances. Laboratory experiments with particle accelerators confirm the observation. Plasma's behavior is driven by conditions in those circuits. Fluctuations can form double layers, with large potential voltages between them. The electric force in double layers can be much stronger than those from gravitational or mechanical forces. Double layers separate plasma into cells and filaments that can have different temperatures or densities. At times, a double layer might interrupt charge flow in the circuit, causing a catastrophic rise in voltage across it. Across it. 
Powerful energy release of the expanding double layer is sometimes observed in power transmission switchyards when a circuit breaker is opened incorrectly. I think we've all seen those. Hans Elfane identified just such an occurrence when he was contracted by the Swedish power company to investigate some serious accidents that had occurred. A few of the mercury arc rectifiers used in the power transmission circuits had exploded for no apparent reason. Alfane identified the cause as unstable double layers within the plasma flow. He wrote, In Sweden, the water power is located in the north and the industry in the south. The transfer of power between these regions over a distance of about a thousand kilometers was first done with AC, when it was realized that DC transmission would be cheaper. Mercury rectifiers were developed. It turned out that such a system normally worked well, but it happened now and then that rectifiers enor produced enormous overvoltages, so that fat electrical sparks filled the rectifying station and did considerable harm. An arc rectifier must have a very low pressure of mercury vapor in order to stand the high back voltages during half of the AC cycle. On the other hand, it must be able to carry large currents during the other half cycle. It turned out that these two requirements were conflicting. Because of very low pressure, the plasma could not carry enough current. If the current density is too high, an exploding double layer may be formed. This means that, the, that in the plasma, a region of high vacuum is produced. The plasma refuses to carry any current at all. At the sudden interruption, of the 1,000 kilometer inductance produces enormous overvoltages, which may be destructive. There are also double layers in space that emit radio wave over a broad band of frequencies. They can sort galactic material into regions of like composition and condense it. They can accelerate charged particles to cosmic ray energies. Double layers in space can explode for the same reason as Alphine's rectifier releasing more energy than is locally present. This effect can be seen in stellar flares or so-called nova outbursts. Let's just hope the sun never does that. Since plasma is composed of charged particles, their movement constitutes an electric current which generates a magnetic field. Electrons spiral in the resulting magnetic field creating synchrotron radiation that can shine in all high-energy frequencies, including extreme ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. According to Alphane and others, electric power flows along the spiral arms of a galactic circuit, where it is concentrated and stored in a central plasmoid within the galactic bulge. When the current density reaches a critical threshold, the plasmoid discharges along the galaxy's spin axis as an energetic jet of plasma. The phenomenon has been replicated in the laboratory with a plasma focus device. Cosmic plasmas and their activity can be replicated in the laboratory, allowing insights into the large-scale structures that populate the universe. Since gravitational forces cannot be examined in the laboratory, or laboratory, if you choose, Consensus opinions about the gravity-only model of celestial objects suffer from a moribund condition. Hopefully, a fresh perspective will outshine the dark conditions that dominate today's approach. Stephen Smith from the Thunderbolts. About it. Electrical charge superfluid plasma cosmology has a living galaxy cell theory essay here so i can't help myself i have to check it out that's pretty interesting the living mitochondria cells mimic galaxies of the cosmic web filaments plasma membranes analog relativity nuclear membrane of a pig kidney the cytoskeleton underlies the plasma membrane throughout the inside of the cell all cells have a cytoskeleton protein mosaic just beneath the cell that determines the shape of the entire cell. 
Stars fill the interstellar medium, I assume, with complex organic. The inside or plasma of a galaxy, which interacts with carbon nanotube, forming the proteasaic membrane skeleton surrounding inside the membrane of a galaxy. A living galaxy cell surrounded by life in the intergalactic medium. The cytoskeleton is shaped like a galaxy at different views. Very interesting. I've always wondered, you know, the inside of a person is much like the universe. Plasma red blood cell hologram analogy of a living cell galaxy. The ancient Egyptians also equated the universe with the human body. Stars are factories that produce and eject huge amounts of detectable complex organic molecules into the interstellar medium everywhere inside the galaxy. Amino acids self-assemble into proteins and DNA inside carbon nanotubes in outer space. Life might exist in outer space. Conditions showed Johnson Organic nanotubes self-assemble into functional, cellular, macroscopic membranes. 3D and 4D life might exist in outer space at quantum and cosmic scales, still unknown and undetected. Now, many times in my muses of nebula, like, I am so attracted to the nebulas that look like works of art with actual beings humanoid type. And what I always wondered and mused about was, is the nebula that we're looking at a mirror into a grander universe where we're seeing these giant beings moving around? And then it's, of course, it's just a fantasy. But imagine, you know, it is possible that it could be a far grander universe. And we're just a little microcosm of that universe. The creatures are so huge moving around that we see them in, as uh, silhouettes or pictures inside the nebulas. And that goes all the way down to our microcosm world. It's amazing. It really is. And I, I would, if I had to bet, I would say that we're definitely linked all the way up and all the way down into this magic universe. Life might, okay, um, that's interesting that he says that. Plasma blobs form a two-layer plasma membrane with an inner nucleus of gas at atoms. Complex self-organizing plasma structures exhibit all necessary properties to qualify as living inorganic matter. Complex plasmas easily form naturally in galaxy in outer space conditions into helical organic structures. Complex plasma mimics the functions of a living cell. A galaxy is 99.9% .9 plasma. NASA Space Center scientist Dennis Gallagher states that 99.9% .9 of the universe is plasma. Complex plasmas behave like a liquid in very small amounts. Just a few thousand of micron-sized particles that fractally scales to nanometer water size. Star clusters are organized by ISM, interstellar medium, organics, having polarity-driven electromagnetic interactions with incredibly dynamic common single-atom thick carbon nanotubes, buckyballs, graphenes, coupling of the nanoscale to the macroscopic proteins. Did you read the uh, thing on the carbon stars that I had at the end of the sun video? Pause it and read it. It's very interesting along the same lines. Dynamically transforming proteins like actin assembles from only 10 amino acids supplied by common stellar ejections into the ISM, which would self-assemble actin under interstellar space conditions. Actin microtubules are 7 nanometers in diameter and naturally forms double helix structures. The pseudoskeleton protein mosaic is mostly actin that shapes entire cells, galaxies, and the entire cellular cosmic web. Individual star of star clusters inside galaxies look exactly like the locations 
of single individual molecules that comprise actin filaments everywhere throughout a living cell. Star cluster NGC 3603 is only 20,000 light years away. Detectable 10 year changes in star locations defy gravity theories, showing all stars move nearly the same speed. Amen. Well, this is pretty nice. Pictures are failing here. Too bad. Or she. Actin stable space cable. Actin microfilaments are 7 nanometers in diameter and amazingly are the same diameter required for a macroscopic scale friction free high-speed fluid movements inside carbon nanotubes that power multiple cellular processes such as motility and polarity. Individual actin filaments are briefly built and broken randomly, but collectively they line up side by side and form breakage resistant cables shows Michelot. Proteins dynamically transform their structures into const constituently constituently similar amino acids. Ten major amino acids comprise actin, which is 50% of the dry mass of the cell. 50% of the dry mass of the cell. Actin is nearly the same in all species and is the thinnest, most common, strongest, stablest, most tensile, flexible filament in all known life forms. Microfilaments, mostly actin, are everywhere in the cell as solid rods made of globular proteins of actin nanotubes, abundant complex organic molecules, and the interstellar medium would comprise a space metamaterial fabric composed of a transparent cytoplasmic gel connecting entirely the inside of a galaxy except the nucleus. These same living processes that occur inside cells by the dimensionality of carbon manifest and organize macroscopic cosmological phenomena such as by fractal scaling magnetic reconnection oh okay so these guys this they must be a little bit different than uh, than the thunderbolts folks because uh, they don't Magnetic reconnection. Don Scott does not like that word. Carbon nanotubes enter the cell nucleus of cells naturally without harmful effects. The cell nucleus undergoes division and polarity arises when electricity flows through carbon nanotubes. This would cause the nucleus to spin like a black hole of a living galaxy cell. This might be uh, some new folks on the scene. I have not seen any of this stuff before. The title grabbed my attention. I thought I'd bring it to you. Lots of new stuff coming our way from the electric universe. The next decade is going to be very interesting indeed. The more data that pours in, the harder it's going to be to plug those holes. The Keenan Barger. There is no emptiness in the electric universe. According to a recent press release, astronomers are puzzled by the extent, as well as its lack of galaxies, in what is deemed the largest void yet discovered. The void is approximately 2 billion light years in diameter, as astronomers measure distance, and it's within that cosmic bubble that the Milky Way galaxy is said to reside. The problem is, such a structure should not exist. The Keenan Barger Cowie KBC void contains far too little matter for its size. The universe is theorized to be a certain age, as the scientific consensus thinks all matter and all energy came into being during the Big Bang. Based on its theoretical expansion rate, the universe should create various formations for time. The problem with the empty regions like the KBC is that gravity has not had enough time to pull matter into bounded bubbles with empty centers. About 15 years ago, astronomers discovered the, that remote galaxies seem to indicate the universe is expanding faster today than it did in the past. Such anomalous redshift observations threaten Big Bang cosmology. So the existence of negative pressure on gravitational fields was proposed. Negative gravity ideas flew in the face of most theories. So the accelerated expansion was later amended to dark energy. 
because it cannot be detected with any instrument, only inferred. Instead of accepting that observational anomalies exist because the Big Bang Theory is faulty, astronomers resort to theoretical addenda, such as the questionable idea that space can be pulled, twisted, or stretched. In a previous picture of the day, astrophysicists from the University of California were quoted as saying, The universe is made mostly of dark matter and dark energy, and we don't know what either of them is. From the perspective of electric universe theory, it is electricity that drives galaxies and their associated stars. Laboratory experiments confirmed that Birkeley current filaments form structures that resemble spiral galaxies. Birkeley currents have a longer range attractive force than gravity by several orders of magnitude diminishing with the square root of the distance from their current axis. That powerful electromagnetic attraction could also account for the movement of stars near the Milky Way's core, as well as the acceleration of galaxies in deep space. Berkman currents are the strongest long-range attractors in the universe. A physicist and electric universe pioneer, Hans Alfein, said, I have never thought that you could obtain the extremely clumpy, heterogeneous universe we have today, strongly affected by plasma processes, from the smooth, homogeneous one of the Big Bang, dominated by gravitation, from A.L. Pratt, Dean of the Plasma Dissidents, Washington Times, Supplement the World and I, May 1988. Stephen Smith. Page 3. Scientists discover an energetic cosmic serpent in our galaxy. In ancient Egyptian mythology, Apep was the serpent god of darkness, destruction, and chaos. In contemporary astronomy, APEP is the nickname for a massive, just-discovered star system surrounded by serpentine dust swirls and officially known as 2XMMJ160050.7 514245. They just have a way with names. It is believed to be the only such star system of its kind in our galaxy, and it's destined for destruction. We never expected to find such a system in our own backyard. Joseph Kellingham of the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy said in a statement, Kellingham is the author of the study unveiling this discovery published today, November 19th, in Nature Astronomy. Somebody tell Joseph about the electric universe, please. Scientists confirm there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. They confirmed it for about the 1400th time in the last two years. They just keep confirming it, but keep feeling the need that they have to keep confirming it so that it makes them think that they're dealing in reality when they're not. Like its namesake, mythological god of yore, Y.O. R.E., who was blamed for solar eclipses and said to battle the sun god Ra every night. I thought that was Sep. The cosmic serpent Apep is a sign of a very powerful force. Scientists believe that the star system is made up of a binary star system and a single star, which are rotating around each other, held together by electricity. The rotating stars in this system are called wolf rayet stars. They are dying very slowly and will likely end their lives with a gamma ray burst, one of the most energetic explosive forces in the universe. Long duration gamma ray bursts, electricity. Before their end, wolf rayets release powerful stellar winds that hurl out matter at millions of miles per hour. In this system, stellar winds were measured to travel at nearly 7.5 million miles, 12 million kilometers an hour. The dust created by these winds moves much more slowly, swirling like a pinwheel around the connected star system. That's the serpentine swirl dubbed APEP. NASA captures cosmic 
dolphin swimming in Jupiter's clouds. So long and thanks for all the fish. Gamma ray bursts are rare and incredibly powerful, thought to be caused by matter collapsing into a black hole. That doesn't exist. They can last anywhere between a few thousandths of a second to a few hours and can release as much energy in that time frame as the Earth's sun will over its entire lifetime times 50,000. Why not make it bigger? APEP seems to be the first gamma ray burst progenitor found in our galaxy. Before their end, Wolf Rayets release powerful stellar winds that hurl out matter at millions of miles per hour. In this system, gamma ray bursts are rare and incredibly powerful and thought to be caused by matter collapsing into a black hole as we said before, that don't exist. They can last anywhere between a few thousandth of a second and a few hours, and can release as much energy in that time frame as the Earth's sun will over its entire lifetime. APEP seems to be the first gamma ray burst progenitor. If, you know, I love to read lines over twice. Further scientists believe APEP is, could cause... Long duration gamma ray burst, which is when the energetic events last longer than a few seconds. These are some of the most powerful stellar events in the known universe. In cosmic terms, Wolf Rayet stars are short lived. On a human scale, they're practically eternal, lasting hundreds of thousands of years before ending in a dramatic and powerful explosion. All of Violet's work is extensive in areas such as cosmology, physics, astronomy, climatology, and geology. His work has taken him into studying the ancients. And there was a video here. Well, I couldn't find anything under APEP. I did get a hit when I... Or wolf ray at stars and it is spherical shells around stars are signs of electrical activity more than 70 years ago dr charles bruce noted that planetary nebulae are similar to electric discharges he reasoned that their shapes were hourglasses with central stars obscured by dusty toroids. Since nebular shapes are similar to the twisted filaments and spirals of electric discharges, they also appear as near spherical shapes. The recent press release states that a bubble-like structure is wrapped around Wolf Rayet star SH2-308 or Easy Canis Majoris, in the constellation Canis Major. As the announcement says, ongoing radiation from the star pushes the bubble out further and farther, blowing it bigger and bigger, some 60 light years apart. Electric discharges in plasma form double layers along their current axis. Positive charges build up on one side of the clock negative charges on the other. A powerful electric field develops between them, and if enough charge is applied, the double layer glows, otherwise it remains in dark mode and is invisible. In plasma, the electric charges spiral into filaments, which attract each other, sometimes pinching into arc mode discharges. As written many times, Double layers can be pumped with energy from galactic Birkeland currents. Increased flux density draws matter from surrounding space into filaments, igniting nebular gases electrically. Could this be what is reported by the European Space Agency? Unfortunately, at this point in time, the only way to detect double layers in space is to send a spacecraft equipped with a Langmuir probe through them. Local experiments within the solar system detect double layers like those created in the laboratory. Such structures are known as magnetospheres, magnetotails, cometary nuclei, and cometales. In 1981, Nobel laureate Hans L. Fain wrote, it is unpleasant to base far-fetched conclusions on the existence of a structure 
which we cannot detect direct. But the alternative is to draw far-reaching conclusions from the assumption that in distant regions the plasmas have properties which are drastically different from what they are in our own neighborhood. This is obviously far more unpleasant. Filaments, braids, overlapping rings, stacked rings, around the central star. Hourglass shapes and coherent tubes of filaments are visible around SH2308, and I'd probably say around APEP2. In an electric universe, it is not hot gas that flows through space. It is plasma. The physics of electricity apply, not the physics of wind. Inside the shells of planetary nebulae are more and more plasma sheaths that act like capacitors, alternately storing and releasing electric energy. Electric currents ebbs and flows inside and outside sheaths within the shells. The Hubble Space Telescope's image reveals many of plasma's fundamental glow mode characteristics. Since the central star's axis is a Z-pinch funnel, the cylinder of electric current appears to be a circle or bubble. Nebulae are stellar Z-pinches in a flow of electricity, so there is enough power to supply the radiation load of current of the central star. Stars, as written many times elsewhere, are powered by electricity coupled with nebular discharge currents rather than nuclear fusion. Since nebular currents cannot exist beyond their optical glows, they must be part of completed circuits that wind through the Milky Way. Stephen Smith that's the answer of what they're seeing around APEP, electric current, ionized. Ionized electric plasma. That article leads into another one here. Capacitance, resistance, and induction power of the sun. We went through the sun already, but we'll see what, see what it has to say. What are stars? And by extension, what is the sun? Consensus opinions state that the sun is composed of elements formed in the Big Bang. Other elements created in dying stars and elements formed in supernovae. Explosions. Primordial hydrogen and helium make up 98% of its overall mass. Inside the sun on a conveyor system that depends on convection and shock waves. The fact Having that some kinetic lag. energy dominates astronomical coming out. theories is illustrated by a recent press release from the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, the Hinode spacecraft. In orbit around the sun, observe the strongest magnetic field ever directly measured on the surface of the sun. However, the bias toward mechanical action is obvious when they Hello. It's time to see who is watching. Because I have no idea. You know, I stream for all. I got one person. Are you kidding me? Is that for real? No, okay, Whew. that was the wrong board. Hold on, I'm going to put you on uh, OBS. I've, I've been wondering, every time I watch one of my old streams, I'm like, why Why am I not putting the chat board? I, just, I guess I always assumed that it would be showing on the side, but sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. I think if I edit it, I lose the chat. I just wanted to see if I actually had anybody out here. I do, yeah. Okay, we're going good. How are you doing, everybody? Buried Axe Blade, Keith J. Get out of the John Boy. Buried Axe Blade. Keith J. Canyon Roots. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I enjoy having you. You guys. It's that bad, huh? 
Uh, mind reader. Uh, Keith J. Mind readers. There's Grouch. Uh, Roy Rush. Alchemy. She was first. Is it she or he? I'm sorry. I, I that that name can go either way. So, um, I don't want to. You know, I don't really think I'm a goofball. I just, it's one of them names, you know. Like, I used to know a guy named Kim. You wouldn't think a guy would be named Kim, but they are. I always liked it when he had, he, one of the first things I learned about Saturn theory, actually, was from watching Red Ice and seeing uh, Troy on. And then it went from there. It just kind of collapsed into the electric universe. They both make sense, and I understand why they are advocates of it. Because all them electric scars had to come from somewhere, and all that stuff that matches, and the myth. And it's crazy. I don't understand why mainstream doesn't just get on board, join the team, and come on in for the big win. But they don't. They're, I don't know, just set in their ways. Plus you. Oh, well, welcome aboard. Uh, Dan the Tube Man. Wow, I haven't seen you in a while, bro. I hope you're doing good. You're still rocking. Uh, I got this little intro here. I want, I'm, it's, uh, let's see, where, that's old. Okay, you can see it. Here it is. I had second thoughts. I said, nah, I don't. If giants existed in the remote past, then Genesis 6-4 read, there were giants in the earth in those days. They must have had customs of their own that included religious practices and traditions. Well worth knowing. Had they not been lost forever? Well, maybe not forever. Prehistory tells us all about the extinction of the dinosaurs and the unforeseen rise of brute man, the troglodyte, the Neanderthal, the Cro-Magnon, and then Homo sapiens. The prehistoric record, like the Akashic record, offers evidence of much more than that. Records of giant beings and giant earthquakes, universal deluges, stupendous volcanic explosions, incredible conflagration, and tremendous meteoric impacts. These were terrestrial and celestial events of planet-encircling magnitude, all outlined in the psychological records of mankind. The individual subconscious, or the collective unconscious, if there were humanoid creatures to witness such events as end extinctions, they must have been traumatic in the extreme. The suggestion is that events of apocalyptic dimensions result in racial trauma, cultural amnesia, an individual denial, post-traumatic disorder, brought about by apocalypses. I could imagine it would just be beyond maddening. There are rich, reoccurring individual references in fringe, ancient, and occult literatures to civilizations <laughs> anterior to our own. These civilizations are generally described as seafaring societies with high degree of technological expertise that in some fields surpassed our own as well as psychic attainments that beggar the imagination. I thought it said bugger the imagination. Shambhala, Mu, Lemuria, Atlantis, Avalon, Arcadia, Nuremberg. Their names resonate with the spirit and energy of poetry, with the cultures and societies that flowered in the distant past and then disappeared seemingly beneath the waters of the world. Fauna and flora, edifices and animals and early human beings, seemingly without leaving a trace. Like Debussy's sunken cathedral, the islet of Mount St. Michael, the Menhirs of Karnak, they resonate in the human imagination. They are like dreams come true. Here we enter the realm of dreams. Did not Plato describe art as dreams for the waking mind? Canvas of the earliest days of Earth is in the dream screen of the psychoanalyst 
and describing it might be what is called true dreaming or dreaming true. Dreams begets speculation, and speculation begets theories which may or may not have an air of certainty about them. There is a heritage of speculation, semi-scientific, quasi-scientific, about the face of early Earth. This is the providence of the independent thinker, who plays in modern times the role of the savant or bard of old, who entertains his fellow human being with the tribal lays. In our time, their tales shine with the veneer of science. One of the most influential independent thinkers of the modern period is Hans Horbig, 1860-1931. The Austrian mining engineer who proposed his once popular cosmic ice theory, Horbiger undertook his work in earnest. He regarded himself as a genius, or at least he regarded her his findings as the work of genius. Indeed, he had no false modesty having once boasted that he knew he was right when I knew that Newton was wrong. In 1913, he advanced his theory of the frozen cosmos to the German publication of Gesalkomogony, written in collaboration with Philip Fawthen. His book was widely reprinted, though curiously it never appeared in an English translation. There are two reasons why his work is of present-day interest. First, his philosophy is an instance of a theory contrary to fact, like the flat earth theory or the hollow earth theory. Second, it is an example of the occult thought that attracted the interest of the Nazi theoreticians and ideologues, especially Heinrich Himmler who on behalf of the Third Reich incorporated the cosmic ice theory into Aryan science. For these reasons, its influence was initially limited to the German-speaking world. Indeed, the English-speaking world kept the cosmic ice theory at arm's length. In post-war years, it attracted the interest of a handful of dissident thinkers in England, and their interest sparked that of Seurat, who in turn kindled an interest in these ideas among the French reading public. All in all, Seurat was the most respectable and the most prominent spokesman for such thought in any language, and they only won with an independent reputation as a writer and educator. Now, scanning down further on here, I noticed he's got... Uh, this written, and you can easily, uh, I'm thinking along the lines of Saturn theory, but um, Horbiger is the guy who's got the successive moons crashing into the Earth, his glacial cosmology. Apparently he must have been a German, and, you know. But uh, this is a pretty good little read here. This presents a new development, stimulating and provocative, of the theories advanced in a well-known series of books by H.S. Bellamy and Peter Allen. Like Mr. Bellamy and Mr. Allen, Professor Surratt accepts the glacial cosmology of Horbiger. Its theories of successive satellites crashing into the Earth, or crashing to the Earth, and subsequent global cataclysms. In these events, Professor Surratt argues, are to be found not only the origins of some of our major myths, Atlantis, for example, but also an explanation of certain puzzling anthropological remains of superhuman size. Can, can it have been, he asks, the gravitation pull of our tertiary satellite induced both gigantism and longevity? If so, what happened after the subsequent catastrophe? During a golden age, can ordinary men have walked the earth under the benevolent tutelage of good giants? And did these good giants degenerate into the ogres of legend? The answers suggested by Professor Seurat created wide interest when the book was first published in France. I read it, wrote M. Jean Cocteau, with much more than my eyes alone. It could be alone. that the people in this country drove them 
where to Professor Surratt's way. work is almost equally well known, Atlantis and the Giants will be recognized as a notable contribution to Horbiggerian liter literature. In one of Horbigger's books, I do believe he's got live fish falling from the sky, and lo and behold, it even happens to this day. Apparently, in these spouts that we call tornadoes, but they call typhoons, is it? Something like that. No, a typhoon is a is a hurricane. Uh, what's it called? What's it called? Oh my god, I can't believe I can't remember. Oh, uh, psych well. Professor Surratt is a daring thinker, impatient of provisional conclusions. All his books from the philosophical dialogues written when he was a young man, to that very remarkable book founded on personal experience, The End of Fear, show the same exciting quality in his latest volume, which has created wide interest in France. He develops the glacial cosmology of the Austrian scientist Horbiger and his followers, Mr. H. S. Bellamy and Peter Allen. His theory replaces the picture of a slow and humdrum evolution of the Earth by a violent and cataclysmic one. It describes terrestrial ages in which three moons in succession revolve so close to the Earth that, to quote Professor Surratt, they outshone the Sun, being very much larger, and later circled the Earth several times a day. Well, now you know we could just replace those moons for planets. Because, like Moon said, they're going to have an uplifting effect on the Earth. All of a sudden, everything's going to be a lot lighter. People are going to grow a lot bigger. Animals. And later crashed on the Earth and destroyed all nations. The attraction exerted by these moons was so great that it gathered the waters of the earth into a great bulge around the equator. That would be the Absu, I would imagine. Professor Surratt believes that they brought two golden ages to mankind. For he holds that man was not born until toward the last phase of the second moon. Perhaps 15 million years ago, perhaps 15 million years ago. During the first and the second golden age, high civilizations existed, fostered by benevolent moons. So this would be our third time around. I've heard that before. Then the moon crashed, and the piled up waters at the equator poured north and south, inundating, inundating islands and continents. continents. It was on an earth left by the territory catastrophe that our own modestly attractive moon rose. Horbiger's theory of glacial cosmology is not officially accepted by scientists. Yet the Horbiggerian theory does seem to give a reasonable explanation for more things than the official one. For instance, the gigantic plants and the huge fossilized animals. Professor Surratt points out that an orgasm plant, an organism plant or animal buried normally today does not fossilize. It rots away. Fossils must have been formed by extraordinary pressures, such perhaps as the crash of a moon. And there are the stories, records, Professor Surratt would call them of a giant race. He believes that the giants really existed, and he has an ingenious explanation for them. When those earlier moons circled close to the earth, the gravitation exerted by them lessened the weight of all creatures, drawing them upward. Living things grew taller, and the giant race was born when the moon crashed. Professor Surratt believes that some of the giants escaped and later became the teachers of their high civilization to ordinary mankind. They lived to fabulous ages, 
In Greece, long after their death, they became gods or titans. But on giants, Professor Surratt relies mostly on the Bible, for there are the described objectively, without any theological coloring, since Jehovah, the one true God, could not admit companions or rivals, the Horbigerian theory does provide a possible explanation for the appearance of giants and the creation of man. The atmospheric conditions, let us say, on the other hand, a golden Saturn age when men better. were taught and ruled by wise giants is perhaps nothing more than a pleasing imagination. And say something on a sad note. Uh, of a staunch supporter of the show passed away um, April 1st and I'm just really sorry to hear that <clears throat> and uh, this is for Tony Bipola we're gonna miss you After my animals Who's that moving in next door to me Who's that living next door to you Oh mama you're such a little dirty girl And you know that I'm a real nice guy I'll be your Abby Johnson to the punch There's a dead moon in the sky Only the empires come out when the sun is right Well, I sighed some triangular mass Just to get it right the Faith, don't ask me Well, I don't ask you Every time you pick up a book, you try to read it It don't make sense to you, well come on I got a present for the other day When they work so hard and they never play I want to tell you that it's a-okay You -okay. it can stay this way, you can do it all day I want to tell you that you're all right And everything's wrong, but everything's right Oh, here you come and give me some I'll take you down, you know you're number one Any old girl got what I just want I'll take her right down to the swamp I'll take you right down where you belong Now baby, tell me where you belong But the television won't go on Oh, I got the little posters on my wall Gonna keep me safe from you all So I can change the channel once more Baby, don't leave me alone Don't leave me alone Don't leave me alone Don't leave me alone Baby, 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 don't leave me alone For you, Tony, you're going to be missed. He was a super supporter the whole time I've been here. One of the first. And it was just, it's just... 
Life is sad and life is a bust. All you can do is do what you must. You do what you must do and you do it well. All right. For my friend Tony. Since his schools of thought do not accept electric universe theory, viewing the sun as an anode, or a positively charged terminal with an electric double layer isolating it from charged particles traveling through the galaxy, suggests that the sun experiences charge discharge phenomena inside its heliosphere. Therefore, it is the sun's capacitive, resistive, and inductive aspects that drive its activity. Yes, indeed. Did you know that when you get an x-ray, that inside that x-ray machine is nothing more than an anode and a cathode? It's electrically driven, just like nuclear explosions. They short out the electrostatic field of the Earth. An electric sun means that electric discharges penetrate its photosphere, allowing electric charge to flow into its depths. It is electromagnetic flux tubes, rather than acoustical waveguides, that expose the sun's cooler interior. Those flux tubes connect the sun's electromagnetic environment with other nearby charged bodies, planets, moons, comets, etc., the electric fields in space accelerate charged solar particles, creating coherent electric networks that flow through the solar system. In an electric universe, celestial bodies are immersed in plasma and interact along circuits. Since the sun is electrically interconnected with the Milky Way, it should be thought of as a charged object seeking equilibrium with its environment. Since the balance is not stable, electric charge flowing into and out of the sun can sometimes cause tremendous bursts of energy called solar flares. A positive space charge sheath exists with respect to the interstellar medium, ISM, so sunspots and flares result from variations in electrical conditions. The sun appears to experience cyclic influences that point to an association with a fluctuating galactic circuit. The extent of that circuit is unknown, but probably involves thousands of cubic light years. The electricity moving through transmission lines is also not known. But consensus astronomers are constantly amazed by the power output from solar flares. Solar flares are most likely cosmic lightning bursts discharging vast quantities of matter at near relativistic speeds out into space. As mentioned, the circuit connecting the Sun with the Milky Way probably extends for thousands if not hundreds of thousands of light years, giving some indication that the electrical energy feeding the solar anode must be substantial. The Electric Universe advocate Wal Thornhill wrote, While enormous time and resources have been poured into the effort to understand stars based on a single outdated idea, those familiar with plasma discharge phenomena have been paying close attention, finding simple electrical explanation. After 100 years of neglect, an electrical model of stars is just beginning to emerge. Stephen Smith, with a hat tip to William Thompson. Part 1, Introduction by Inez Adora Perry. Dr. George W. Carey's book, The Relation of the Mineral Salts of the Body to the Signs of the Zodiac, has seen many editions, but it was not until 1906 that I secured my first copy, and mentally hungry for truth, eagerly devoured its pages its pages. Such actual meat and drink it was to me, so fascinatingly interesting, that I was convinced at once of its immeasurable value to humanity. The realization became intensified year after year as constant experience and intensive research were conclusive proof. I believe that the day is not far distant when Dr. Carey will be acclaimed as one of the world's greatest benefactors. In this chaotic and materialistic age, he discovered and published a priceless key that which unlocks the door to mental as well as physical health. An understanding and use of this key will accomplish the physiochemical process whereby mankind can regenerate. 
This means the slow but sure rise from physical and mental degeneracy, disease, unhappiness, and death to the glorious state which is the heritage of everyone. Thus will be consummated the scripture injunction, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matt 548 The great majority of people will be startled, if indeed not actually shocked, by the statement which 15 years of earnest research and experience causes me to make. Duty and a sincere wish to help humanity are also contributing factors. But there is another and more powerful reason. Our solar system is entering in the cycles of the ages. The sign of Aquarius, the son of man, and those who know the truth, or any part of it, must write, speak, and live it. Aquarius is the humanitarian or human sign and the planet vibration Uranus is the ruler of this division of the zodiac which is the path of the solar system therefore as this is the age of truth those who speak and work for it are working in harmony with natural law while those who follow the opposite course will wonder why they are not prospering to prosper means to have sufficient for one's necessities to be physically and mentally comfortable it is only truth that matters. Opinions do not count. Dr. Carey was not interested in the latter. He was an echinoclast. He felt impelled to make significant statements, no matter how they were received. My method and purpose is the same as his. I inspire to give out facts, as I know and have proved them to be. Therefore, please consider carefully and earnestly the following statement, which should be written in letters of flame. A knowledge of and the practice of the process necessary to the attainment of perfection is absolutely impossible without a thorough understanding of, of physiological chemistry. This Dr. William Schuessler furnished in his biochemic system of medicine, and the perfect key was supplied by Dr. Carey in his allocation of the biological salts the zodiac signs. The truth of the foregoing statement is as definite and real to me as the fact that I live, moving, and have my being. I wish it could be made even more empath empathic so that it would be engraved forever in the minds of those who read it. Dr. Schussler's system is the only true system of medicine, for it is the method of supplying the blood with its component parts. The Bible most truly states a great chemical fact. Leviticus 17.11 I never heard of that one before. <laughs> in the following words, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Oh. As the blood is the life of the flesh, it naturally follows that, as man is a trinity, body or flesh, soul and spirit, the quality, condition or health of his body determines that of his soul which corresponds in the exact degree. The word atonement means at one meant atonement or harmony. At one meant or harmony. If the blood were chemically perfect, the highly differentiated and attenuated nerve and glandular fluids, which constitute the soul, would also be perfect. It is only when the blood is chemically perfect that the full quota of spirit, otherwise God power, can enter the body, for like attracts like. The study of Schussler's biochemistry enables us to become acquainted with all different kinds of material or basic substance, which the great chemist and architect of the universe created as a medium for the spirit, which is life. Spirit manifests imperfectly when material is deficient. Deficiency means disease, lack of ease, inharmony, imperfection. Dormant, unhealthy, or imperfect brain cells do not make for an efficient brain. Thought corresponds to the nature and condition of the brain cell, for they consume our thought machine, and the quality and value of that which brings forth depend entirely on its condition. Herein lies the explanation of all the trouble in the world. Sin, crime, disease, death, unhappiness, insanity, fear, cowardice, lack of positivity, differences in opinions, and the wars of nations and peoples. Each one of us represents a conscious or aggregate of vibrations, a sum total of those present in nature at the time we become 
we come into birth. Indeed, it is what makes birth possible. A certain rate of vibration is manifesting at the particular time, and a corresponding result is produced. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Sowing and reaping, reaping and sowing, constitute birth and death. If we were not responsible for the kind of life we live, we would not be accountable for the form of death which we attract. Hmm, interesting. It is not then equally logical that a reincarnating ego must because of the vibratory law of attraction come to birth in an environment and in two conditions which are decided by this self-same law otherwise justice would not exist justice is conformity to divine law it is the working out the expression or administration of law doing the right thing because it is the best in greek mythology which constitutes the sacred and secret writings of that people. We find this statement, which, it seems to me, agrees perfectly with the foregoing. Amphion built the walls of Thebes, the human head, by charming, producing a harmonious vibration. The stones, mineral elements, into their places by the music of his lyre. The lyre is a certain marvelous organ, in the head. Hmm. It is a poetic way of stating that the human head, which is the beginning of the human body, is formed according to a vibratory law, for by it the very mineral atoms are grouped. Together the cells form. The meaning of Thebes is head. It was originally a physiological term. Showing the chemical correspondence of the mineral salt, caliphose or phosphate, of potassium. To the highest part of the head, the cerebrum, alone elevates Dr. Carey to the heights where honor and graduate should forever be accorded him. For this salt is the dynamic material which generates spiritual electricity and ensouls the physical form with life. This is only one of his twelve astounding allocations. For astrology, the synthesizer of all knowledge, both cosmic and microcosmic, in the universe and in man, reveals to us why Caliphaz is the airy salt, the substance through which the Most High manifests the man, is the cause of actual life in his form. And to the degree in which the cerebral spinal nerves are supplied with it, will energy or life manifest in and through him? The light of intelligence, spirit or father, will burn brightly if this substance, which alone can feed it, is sufficiently and adequately furnished. Therefore, perfect supply of the right chemical elements means perfect cells, perfect brain, perfect thought, perfect acts, perfection, a God-man. In contributing the foregoing, I bespeak my deep and lasting gratitude to Dr. George W. Carey for the chemical light which he has thrown on dark places. Reader truth is the water of life. May you drink deeply and begin to learn how to live forever. And let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire and lack nothing. James 1.4 I've been doing, I get the cell salts. Yeah, it's got the 12 basic salts, and I don't have any stock or anything like that or any interest, but I'm just informing you because it's healthy. It's called bioplasma. And you, there are little salt pills, but they taste sweet. I don't know how they did that, but they're supposed to have you put three or four under your tongue sublingually every day, and then when you get it, when you get right, you only have to do it once a week or so. But I've been doing it for almost five years now, and I haven't had a cold. That that was what spawned me to want to start doing this. I started taking bioplasma about four or five years ago after my last doozy of a cold that I had. I haven't had one since, so. It's got to be something to it. The 12 cell salts. Okay. Just wanted you to know that. It's important. The major properties of the electric sun, ES model, are as follows. Most of the space within our galaxy is occupied by plasma, rarefied ionized gas, containing electrons negative charges, and ionized atoms, positive charges. Every charged particle in the plasma has an electric potential energy, voltage, just as every pebble on a mountain has a mechanical potential energy with respect to sea level. The sun is at the center of a plasma cell, 
called the heliosphere that stretches far out. Introduction to the Electric Cosmos. Don Scott. What is wrong with present-day accepted astrophysics? It is not scientific. In today's world, many people characterize themselves as being scientists. Only those who always carefully follow the scientific method are deserving of that title. Modern establishment astrophysics fails the test in several ways. The Empirical Scientific Method Scientists are distinguishable from artists, poets, musicians, and others in that they use what is known as the scientific method. It is not that inspiration or the muse is not valuable in science. It is, but it is not the starting point of what we call science. In the process, called the scientific method, a true scientist will observe nature carefully, record what is seen, to seek patterns in the observed data, put numbers on the data, fit equations to those numbers. 3. Generalize those equations into a world description of the process. This is a hypothesis. 4. Carry out experiments and or gather independent data to see how well the hypothesis predicts future observations and results. This is called closing the loop on your hypothesis. Reject or modify the hypothesis if the experiment show it falls short of success in these predictions. Only after the results of several experiments have been successfully predicted by the hypothesis can it be called a theory. If two different theories predict a given phenomenon equally well, the simpler theory is probably the best one. This principle is called Occam's Razor. Theories can never be proven to be correct. Some other mechanism entirely may be the cause of the observed data. But theories can be disproved if they fail to predict the outcomes of additional experiments. Such theories are termed to be falsified. Sometimes the scientific method, as described above, is called the empirical method, the deductive method. As an alternative to the empirical method, there is a method of deriving theories from assumed generalizations about the universe. This is called the deductive method. In this process, one starts with a law of nature, or obviously correct, generalization about the way things work, and deduces, reasons out, derives its consequences in detail. A hypothesis arrived at via this method is promoted to the status of being a theory, if a large enough body of experts accept it. Thus, in this method, a vote of experts determines if the theory is correct. Once such a theory has been accepted, it is not easily rejected in the light of conflicting evidence. It is, however, often modified, made more complex, and, unfortunately, new data is often selectively chosen to support it. The selection and publication of only the data that support the accepted theory is expedited by the peer review system. If the experts who have accepted a given theory control both the funding of future research and also what gets published, there is little chance for conflicting viewpoints to develop. Pseudoscience Some hypotheses, when presented by August, well-established scientists are given credence without anyone questioning whether the hypothesis has been developed using the scientific method. Yet, in most cases, it is not difficult to check whether or not scientific method has been used correctly. For example, consider the hypothesis that there are gnomes in my garden that always make themselves invisible when anyone tries to observe them. Clearly, no conceivable experiment or observation could falsify that statement. This is evidence the hypothesis comes from a pseudo-scientific source. Legitimate theories must be falsifiable. The problem forced by modern astronomy is that experiments are not possible because the stars are light years away. We cannot hope to be able to go there and perform experiments on them. 
Until relatively recent, even the planets were out of reach. Thus, cosmologists never get to complete the scientific method. We cannot close the loop in cosmology, but if we cannot test our hypotheses, how can we reject or modify them? The answer, of course, is that astrophysicists, more than those in any other branch of science, must be exceedingly careful to continually examine their hypotheses in the light of any new data. It is the contention of the author of these pages that they have not been doing this. Einstein was a purely theoretical physicist. He never went near a physics lab. He conducted only Gedankenexperimenten, Gedankenexperimenten, thought experiments. In order to arrive at his general theory of relativity, GR. This is a perfect example of the deductive method at work. Its use is exceptionally dangerous in an area like cosmology, wherein it is difficult to falsify any theory. Now that GR theory is accepted by the establishment astrophysics, any new data, such as photographs of the astronomical object known as the Einstein cross, are discussed only within the framework of this complicated theory. The images of the four small objects in the Einstein cross, when looked at only from this viewpoint, are considered to be supporting evidence for the GR theory. However, they could just as well be interpreted as being evidence supporting a much simpler cosmological theory. Evidence contradictory to the accepted Big Bang theory, such as images of connections between objects that have widely different redshift values, are dismissed as being mirages. False Assumptions in Astrophysics Most of today's accepted astronomy cosmology is a set of deductively arrived at hypotheses precariously based on two false assumptions. One. Electrical fields, currents, and plasma discharges are not important in space. Only gravitational and magnetic fields are important. 2. If the light from an object exhibits redshift, the object must be speeding away from us, and its distance from us is directly proportional to that speed. Both of these assumptions are demonstrably wrong, and they have been, and continue to be, contradicted by actual observations of the sky. Those observations tell us that the universe is highly electrical in nature, and two, redshift is more a measure of an object's youth than its velocity. The continued refusal of astrophysicists to re-examine their hypotheses in light of these new observations is the focus of these pages. And I'll just say this, um, he says gravitational and magnetic fields are important. I would say magnetic fields are a recent installment, and that's uh, not what Dave Talbot calls taking the back door to the electric universe. The continued refusal of astrophysics to re-examine their hypotheses in light of these new observations is the focus of these pages. Invisible entities invented to patch up failing theories. The theories that have sprung from these faulty, overcomplicated mathematical models, I would say monstrosities, have given birth to such arcane notions as curved space, neutron stars, wimps, and now wimpzillas, machos, several different types of black holes, superluminal jets, dark energy, and magnetic field lines that pile up merge, and reconnect. All of these inventions are fictions put forth by astrophysics in desperate efforts to defend their theories when faced with contradicting observations. None have ever been observed or photographed. Many of them are demonstrably impossible. Demonstrably. But their existence is repeatedly invoked to explain new observations and measurements that contradict the enshrined theories of modern astronomy without resorting to the use of electrical principles. We continually hear statements such as, There must be a black hole at the center of the galaxy. Otherwise, we cannot explain its level of energy output. There must be invisible dark matter in the galaxy. 
Otherwise, we cannot explain how it rotates the way it does. 99% of the universe is made up of dark energy. Otherwise, the Big Bang Theory is falsified. Pulsars must be made of strange matter. Otherwise, we might have to look for an electrical explanation. We are also asked to believe that two objects, like Galaxy NGC 4319 and its companion, Markarian 205, are not connected together, even though we have photographs of the connection. So we are told not to believe in things that we can see, but that we should believe in the existence of the magic entities that their theories require, even though we cannot see or measure them. Astrophysics denigrate outsiders, then quietly adapt their new ideas. Their have been several instances in the past when the astronomical mainstream has long rejected the idea that is later accepted. There is usually no public disgrace for the in-group who were on the wrong side of the issue. When, after being viciously denigrated, the validity of a new idea becomes inescapably obvious. A few years ago, oh, a few years go by, and then we quietly hear, well, everyone has known for a long time that this, the new idea, was always true. <laughs> Absolutely. An example of this is Hans Alfain's discovery of plasma waves. This relatively recently discovered property of plasmas is now being wrongly used by astrophysics to explain away all sorts of what is, for them, enigmatic phenomena, such as the temperature inversion in the sun's lower corona. The future. In a few years, perhaps we will hear, well, everyone has known for a long time that quasars are not extremely distant, distant and redshift is more a measurement of youth of an object than its recessional velocity and distance. No one said for sure there ever was a Big Bang. It was just another false theory. Everyone has known for a long time that electric currents flowing in plasmas produce many of the mysterious observed solar and cosmic phenomena, and we will not hear of machos, wimps, neutronium, dark energy, and broken magnetic field lines from any serious scientist ever again. Time will tell. Will the founders of the electric plasma universe theory be acknowledged as having been the pathfinders they are? Or will lesser men quietly adopt these ideas without giving credit to their originators and then claim them to be well known? This website. The following pages discuss some of the people, observations, and ideas that challenge the false assumptions that mainstream science refuses to re-examine. When you read them, remember that any single unanswered challenge of this sort is enough to bring down the pseudo-scientific magic show that modern astronomy cosmology has become, like a house of cards. Don Scott. Astronomers think FRBs are created from dying stars. About eight years ago, astronomers discovered an energy signature they called a fast radio burst, or FRB. The blast of radio waves lasted five milliseconds, releasing more energy than the sun puts out in a month. Distance to the source was said to be almost three billion light years, and was surmised to come from the death of a black hole. Another source for FRB energy is thought to be from cosmic batteries. If a black hole orbits a neutron star, its immense gravity is thought to create the power that sends those strange bursts into space. Cosmologists recently advanced a theory that black holes can evaporate with surprising violence. If a black hole contains M solar masses, it will glow. At, at 6 times 10 to the power of 8 M Kelvin, that means a black hole can eventually explode like a hydrogen bomb. It is those explosions that are supposed to generate radio emission. Recently, astronomers working with a combination of radio regarding optical telescopes announced that FRB 121102, the first repeating fast radio burst, exploded into space with the force of many supernovae. As the press release states, however, astronomers now have a new 
puzzle. The source of the broadcast is from a surprisingly small galaxy. Since the galaxy is puny, it is thought that the black hole physics must be involved with FRB formation. Black holes radiating away their masses does not conform to electric universe theory. Radio waves and range of energy curves are properties of lightning bolts. Computer simulations demonstrate that plasma phenomena are scalable over several orders of magnitude, so they behave in the same way whether in atoms or galaxies. Perhaps FRBs are really flashes of cosmic lightning erupting from electrified clouds of plasma on an immense scale. If correct, FRBs are most likely nearby, so they are less energetic. Plasma is the correct way to interpret their behavior, but it is exploding double layers that impel them. Rather than relying on mathematical phantoms like black holes in tandem with overweight neutron stars, why not create real testable hypotheses and work them up with real physical models? Plasma experiments in the laboratory correspond to plasma formations in space. Because of the scalability factor, under similar conditions, Plasma discharges produce the same formations independent of size, whether in the laboratory or on a planetary, stellar, or galactic level. Since duration is proportional to size, an electric spark that lasts for microseconds in the laboratory might last for years at the stellar scale or millions of years at the galactic scale. Stephen Smith, very good. And we have another one, power in perspective. What astronomers call a fast radio burst can release more energy in five milliseconds than the sun does in 80 years. Assume distances to such high energy sources is said to be a billion light years or more because of redshift measurements. If that is the case, then the power concentrated in those flashes of energy is equivalent to billions of hydrogen bombs. What could generate those forces? At the outset, it is important to consider that in an electric universe, radio waves and a range of energy curves are properties of lightning bolts. Computer simulations demonstrate that plasma phenomena are scalable over several orders of magnitude. They behave in the same way and illustrate basic premise whether in atoms or galaxies. Recently, physicists working with the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder announced the discovery of so many FRB sources that they effectively doubled the catalog listings, according to Dr. Jean Pierre McCourt from the Center for Radio Astronomy Research. Bursts travel for billions of years, passing through intergalactic material along the way. Each time this happens, the different wavelengths that make up the burst are slowed by different amounts timing the arrival of the different wavelengths tells us how much material the burst has traveled through on its journey. Assumptions about distance and the density of matter in the universe are built on previous assumptions about the size of the universe and its age. Light waves traveling for billions of years through uncounted clouds of gas and dust betrays a factual presumption underlying all ideas about distance and conditions in the universe. Its size is based on Big Bang Theory and black holes factor. And when FRB energies are discussed by the mainstream, collisions among black holes or the explosion of black holes are held forth as explanations for the energy signatures. However, laboratory experiments confirm that plasma formations in space can be modeled in the laboratory. Laboratory experiments confirm that plasma formations in space can be modeled in the laboratory due to their scalability. Under similar conditions, plasma discharges produce the same formations independent of size. Since duration is proportional to size, an electric spark 
that last for microseconds in a laboratory might last for years in the stellar scale, scale or millions of years in the galactic scale, where they might suddenly erupt and then dim again. Electric Universe cosmologists postulate that FRBs are actually occurring in nearby galactic neighborhoods, so they are not unimaginably powerful and not coming from the edge of the universe, as previously written. Plasma discharges in the form of exploding double layers can accelerate particles in ways that are unfamiliar to consensus astrophysicists. Consensus, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Plasma physicist and Nobel laureate Dr. Hans Elfane, Hans Elfane, thought that exploding double layers should be considered a new class of celestial object. Electricity is responsible for stellar and galactic behaviors, and when the current density gets too high, double layers in those circuits catastrophically release their excess energy, appearing as FRBs, X-rays, or flares of ultraviolet light. Alfane wrote, A study of how a number of the most used textbooks in astrophysics treat important concepts like double layers, critical velocity, pinch effects, and circuits is made. It is found that students using these textbooks remain essentially ignorant of even the existence of these, in spite of the fact that some of them have been well known for half a century, e.g., Double layers, Langmuir, 1929 pinch effect, Bennett, 1934. If correct, FRBs are actually nearby, so are less energetic. Plasma is the correct way to interpret their behavior, but it is exploding double layers that impel them. Rather than relying on mathematical phantoms like black holes, why not create real testable hypotheses and work them up with real physical models? Perhaps FRBs are really flashes of cosmic lightning erupting from electrified clouds of plasma in an immense scale. Stephen Smith first of the Greek philosophers and mathematicians to unravel the celestial plan and announce the discovery was Aristarchus of the Isle of Samos. Others before him assumed that the earth is a sphere and that it moves, but he was the first to formulate plainly the heliocentric theory, the scheme which has the sun in the center. Aristarchus lived from about the year 310 before the present era to about 230, and among the geometers he succeeded Euclid and preceded Archimedes. In 288 or 287 BC, he followed Theophrastus as the head of the peripatetic school established by Aristotle. Aristarchus' only extant treatise is on the sizes and distances of the sun and moon, and he calculated the diameter of the sun as about seven times the diameter of earth, thus estimating the sun's volume as about 300 times the volume of the earth. The actual diameter of the sun is about 300 times the diameter of the earth. The solar volume is equal to 1,300,000 volumes of the earth. In this work of Aristarchus, there is nothing indicating his heliocentric theory. It was probably this, his realization of the superior mass of the sun, that brought him to his discovery. Or should a celestial body 300 times larger than the earth revolve around it each day? Aristarchus' book on the planetary system, with the sun in the center, did not survive, and we know of it only through references to its content, chiefly by Archimedes. Archimedes, who was 25 years his junior, wrote, Aristarchus brought out a book consisting of certain hypotheses. His hypotheses are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, and that the earth revolves around the sun in the circumference of a circle, the sun laying in the middle of the orbit. He also added that according to Aristarchus, who is in contradiction to the common account of astronomers, the universe is many times larger than generally assumed by the astronomers, and the fixed stars are at an enormous distance from the sun and its planets. Aristarchus regarded the sun as one of the fixed stars, the closest to the earth. Aristarchus sets the sun among the fixed stars, and holds that the earth moves around the sun's circle, i.e. ecliptic, referred another author centuries later. As Archimedes said, the view of Archimedes conflicted with the common teaching of the astronomers, and he also quoted it only to put it aside disapprovingly. One of the contemporaries of Aristarchus, Cleanthes, wrote a treatise against Aristarchus. Whatever his scientific argument may have been, 
he accused Aristarchus of the act of impiety. Plutarch, in his book, Of the Face and the Disc of the Moon, that Cleanthes thought it was the duty of the Greeks to indict Aristarchus of Samos on the charge of impiety for putting in motion the hearth of the universe, this being the effect of his attempt to save the phenomena by supposing heaven to remain at rest and the earth to revolve in an oblique circle while it rotates at the same time about its own axis we do not know whether there was any actual court action and verdict however we know that a verdict of judges even if unanimous could not make the sun a satellite of the earth not even a scientific tribunal can do this not even if it's presided over by archimedes and the most illustrious men of the generation sit as judges the spokesman of the scholarly world was der Catholics, who announced that we must assert the earth the hurt of the house of the gods according to plato to remain fixed in the planets with the whole embraced in heaven to move and reject the view of those who brought to rest the things which move and set in motion the things by which their nature and position are unmoved such a supposition being contrary to the theories of mathematicians aristarchus had no followers in his generation nor in the next generation about a century after aristarchus Saleucus, Saleucus, a chaldean of Seleucia on the tigris who lived and wrote about the year 150 before the present era adopted the teaching of aristarchus hipparchus hipparchus was a contemporary of Seleucus. 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 Hipparchus is thought to be the greatest astronomer of antiquity, and even today there are worshippers of his among the members of the faculty. But he rejected the heliocentric system of Aristarchus, and this he did not on a religious ground, but on a scientific one. A system with the sun in the center of circular orbits could not account for peculiarities in the visible motions of the planets but the theory of epicycles could and this theory had the earth immobile in the centre of the universe thus the religious dogma and the mathematical analysis both condemned aristarchus and his teaching that the earth circles around the sun archimedes ed heiberg volume two p two hundred and forty four aaron arius i four to seven the works of archimedes ed heath pp two hundred and twenty one to two hundred and twenty two C. Heath, Aristarchus of Samos, Oxford University Press, 1913, ETS E.24.8 Docs, Grach, P. 355.19 Beck, Diogenes Laetius, Lives of the Famous Philosophers, mentions such a tract among the works of Cleanthus. C. F. T. H. Heath, Aristarchus of Samos, Oxford, 1913, De Facie in Orbe, ICH. 6 pp 92 f 923 a cf heath aristarchus of samos p 304 suns and planets in neolithic rock art if you have had your attention directed to the novelties of thought in your own lifetime you will have observed that almost all really new ideas have a certain aspect of foolishness when they are first presented. A. Whitehead In science, unlike religion, great revelations lie in the future. The coming generations are the authorities, and the pupil is greater than the master. If he has the gift to see things anew, all fruitful ideas have been conceived in the minds of nonconformists. Here I am. <laughs> For whom the known is still the unknown, and who often went back to begin where others passed by, sure of their way. The truth of today was the hearsay of yesterday. Emanuel Velikovsky. Brilliant. I love the man. In Worlds in Collision, Emanuel Velikovsky claimed that the planets only recently settled upon their present orbits that in fact great cataclysms have distinguished the recent history of the solar system all agree that if true this thesis would have profound implications for various branches of natural science particularly celestial mechanics and cosmology few agree however as to what constitutes valid evidence of the sort of events Velikovsky describes. Brown 25. 
<laughs> what I'm trying to say is, if you bring them evidence, they should be all too willing to want to look into it. It doesn't matter how crazy it sounds. If it exceeds your imagination, you know, like Wall says, that should have been the reason why he looked into it. I mean, someone brings me something that sounds far out, I'm going to say, well, you know what, that sounds really far out, and just close my mind to it. I don't know. That's just something wrong about that. Even if you don't like it at first, if it's true, you have to look at it. You have to at least give it a chance to be right. If I was his boss, I would relieve him because he's doing the world a disservice. As hard as it is for me to wrap my head around a magazine controlling the science world because of the editor, and he's an incomprehensible mathematician, well, that says a lot, right? He's, instead of being uh, the guy who's going to do his job, he's just suppressing anything that might take him away from his. Uh, we got people like that in too many places in the world. It needs to stop. If you can poke holes in it all day long, well, then you don't have to worry about it. But if it's stubborn and it keeps showing itself to be right, the only thing you can do is embrace it. That's really, that's it. But they don't even act like there's any data out there that conflicts with them. That's where I have the problem. Watching Neil deGrasse Tyson he is just a, a nutbag. You know, he's all about himself. You can tell by his big sure of himself, and but he doesn't debate. Oh, I heard him say that on Joe Rogan. You don't debate. I wonder why. Because you don't want to be embarrassed and get your drawers he's blown off. He's got like but three fraternity suits. For the Titanic <laughs> and tell him, you got the moon in the wrong place. Uh, I'm Mr. Smart Guy. You know, he's so smart that he doesn't even really know what runs the universe. I have a feeling they know. They just, you know, you know, you know, you know. They can't pay attention to it or they get run out of town. I've never in my life ever would have thought that beings as intelligent as humans have that roadblock in their way and allow it. I just, I don't understand why so many people are so driven for profit. Everybody would love to be a millionaire, but I don't think about it. Well, okay, maybe I think about it every once in a while. But you know what I mean. I don't obsess over it. I don't have to try to keep up with the Joneses. They don't have a shiny life. They got That has uh, an effect on us. I remember when I was younger and we were, that did, suggested that advanced claims regarding the state of various planets, such as the inordinate it got cut out of venus i always Radio remember noises, being poor and happy from jupiter both anticipated by velikovsky prior to their discovery constituted prima facie evidence in support of the thesis you know His what critics I mean. however because the truth always has critics countered that correct predictions do not always constitute verification pardon my french ladies but it's like putting tits on a bull or it's like putting perfume on a pig of the underlying theses. While some even question the specificity and or verification of Velikovsky's advanced claims. One, thus question remains. What sort of evidence apart from Venus suddenly leaving its current orbit and resuming a comet-like appearance would it take to convince conventional scholars that the planet recently moved upon a different orbit, that the ancient skies were vastly different than the ones we see today? I mean, we are so lucky. It is apparently not enough that ancient peoples from around the world said as much. For example, a survey of ancient traditions reveals the following recurring motives. 1. In ancient times, different suns dominated visible heavens. 2. The world was once plunged into darkness and brought to the brink of destruction when the sun was eclipsed as a result of being swallowed by a giant dragon. 3. On one, Wouldn't that just kind of make you want to scratch your head and investigate it? But it sounds crazy, yeah. But if they're saying that, I mean, they're not just smoking dope and writing anything. On one occasion, it is said the planet Venus took on a comet-like appearance. 2. Such traditions, in the rare event that they are encountered and subjected to analysis, are notoriously difficult to interpret, and in any case, are typically explained away as poetic metaphor, having little basis in reality. 
I mean, seriously, the mainstream scientists, I don't know how they don't bore themselves to death, but they seem to like being bored. Indifference to the currently prevailing opinion which would downplay the importance of ancient mythological traditions. We seek a more objective source of evidence with which to explore the nature of the ancient cosmos, in addition to the ancient literary traditions. Another record exists which offers evidence in support of recent changes in the solar system, namely prehistoric rock art. I love that stuff. Ancient sky watchers from around the world have been drawing pictures of the celestial bodies since time immemorial. The fact is that such pictures cannot be made to accord with the current arrangement of the solar system, prehistoric petroglyphs of the sun. The discovery in 1879 of spectacular paintings in the caves of Altamira, Spain, was initially met with disbelief and ridicule. So radical was the idea that Stone Age men could have created art of such sophistication and beauty, and it is sophisticated and beautiful. It was only upon the discovery of similar finds in France, Portugal, and elsewhere in Europe that the scientific world became forced to accept the reality of Paleolithic rock art. Indeed, I have this idea of uh, playing rock music and showing rock art in a video. I may do that. Just put it in my community section unlisted. It has since been shown that rock art is abundant upon all inhabited continents and spans a period of time measured in millennia. The paintings of Voltamira and Lasso are typically dated to circa 10 to 20,000 BC. 3. During the Paleolithic Age, rock art was primarily devoted to the realistic presentation of various forms of wildlife, the latter presumably objects of the hunt and rites of sympathetic magic. Especially common are paint. Now, it's people that are already messing around with magic, and they make these brilliant paintings. They had bigger brains than we did, and who knows, maybe uh, less junk DNA, or who knows, they're referring to Cro-Magnon, man. Especially common are paintings of horses and Wysant, and great bison that once roamed the steppes of Europe. Although mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, and other long extinct fauna also appear. It was during the Neolithic Age, apparently, that man began recording his perceptions of celestial phenomena through paintings and petroglyphs, incised images and rock, not unlike fossilized bones, which provide an objective record against which to check the deductions drawn by paleontologists. Rock art represents objective record of mankind's enduring interest in the stars and offers a check upon conclusions deduced from comparative mythology, period. Among the most common petroglyphs are those typically interpreted as images of the sun. Included here are some sample images featuring a circular disk from which rays emanate in all directions. Certainly, this is how one might expect our forebears to have depicted the current solar orb. Other images, however, are more difficult to interpret. Consider this figure, figure 2. One of the most common images in all of ancient rock art depicts what would appear to be a circular disk with a smaller orb set within its center. Even more difficult to reconcile with the current appearance of the sun is this figure, figure 3 which depicts a flower-like object set against the backdrop of an orb or disk. Although less common than figure two, this image also has parallels throughout the ancient world. Consider further the image represented in this figure, figure four. How is it possible to explain the wheel-like spokes, typically four or eight in number, of this supposed solar petroglyph? by reference to the current sun, and yet this very image occurs throughout the ancient world. The most perplexing, perhaps, is the fact that such images occur in Neolithic contexts and thus predate by several millennia the invention of spoked wheels. Figure 5 finally adds a pillar-like appendage to the aforementioned images. Here again, we are dealing with a petroglyph of universal distribution, typically 
interpreted as the sun with rays. Uh, it looks kind of funny, but, you know, it, it looks like the pillar, of course. Although the various sun images occur in wide variety of artistic contexts, you can kind of... It is not uncommon to find them associated with scenes of apparent worship and ritual. Well known, for example, are engravings depicting people offering salutations to the sun god with upraised arms. In Kamanaka Valley, arguably the richest and most thoroughly excavated petroglyph site in the world, Anadi observes the carvings of the first period are limited to the depiction of one person praying facing the sun, which is drawn as a disc with a dot in its center. Such scenes coupled with the obvious prominence of the sun in ancient religion, have led scholars to assume that the solar images served some sort of religious purpose for the Stone Age artists and their community. Although the various sun images occur in a wide variety of, of artistic contexts, it is not uncommon to find them associated with scenes of apparent worship and ritual. The anomalies presented by these images have not escaped the attention of scholars. Aside from the fact that each of them is routinely identified and fingerprinted with the sun, the various sun images would appear to have very little in common apart from the presence of a smaller orb in the center of a larger disk. In the sun gods of ancient Europe, M. Green offered the following observation. It is very difficult to interpret the exact meaning of these sunlight images occurring on passage gravestones. If we may assume that the signs are symbolic, then either they are purely abstract or they represent something in the natural world. They just Wilcox asked, not without some justification, why the ancients would see so many symbols, so many different symbols for the sun. Wilcox asks, not without some justification, why the ancients would need so many different symbols for the sun. Noting that the forms claim to be solar symbols do not really look like the sun. Wilcox would regard them as non-representational in nature and suggests their origin is rooted in psychology. Of course he does. There would thus appear to be two schools of thought with regard to these so-called solar images. That which would regard them as rooted in the natural world and thus representational and that which would regard them as non-representational, in so much as anything that has to do with electricity. No, I'm just kidding, I made that up. In so much as each of these petroglyphs might be paralleled on any of the inhabited continents, it is difficult to accept the proposition that they are purely abstract in nature. No doubt, it's difficult to accept the proposition that they are purely abstract in nature. Whatever they represent, it seems clear that the images had as their inspiration some objective reference in the natural world. How then do scholars explain the peculiar nature of the sun images? I always like that. Here Green speculates that for some reason ancient man was unable or disinclined to depict the sun as it actually appears. When we look at the way that mankind in ancient Europe depicted the image of the sun, we see immediately that its obvious circularity dominated his perception. But what is more interesting is that man did not simply look at the sun and copy what he saw to the best of his ability. He went further and interpreted the superimposed new images of the sun, which were not based entirely on his visual perception. Why this should be the case is not intuitively obvious. There's a good phrase, intuitively obvious. I write phrases down sometimes if I like them. That's a good one. That's a keeper. That's like sat in sarcastic triumph. You know, I like that too. Filikovsky would describe the professors that were watching him with their arms folded as sitting there in sarcastic triumph. All right, I gotta write that down just a second here. Yeah. One might think that part of communicating the sanctity of a religious symbol would be recording it faithfully, particularly if the symbol served a magical or epitropaic purpose, as in fact is known to be the case with sun ages which are featured prominently 
on amulets throughout the ancient world. Moreover, it is common to find solar petroglyphs on, which were not based entirely on his visual perception. Why this should be the case is not intuitively obvious. There's a good phrase, intuitively obvious. I write phrases down sometimes if I like them. That's a good one. That's a keeper. That's like sat in sarcastic triumph. You know, I like that too. Filikovsky would describe the professors that were watching him with their arms folded as sitting there in sarcastic triumph. All right, I gotta write that down just a second, yeah. One might think that part of communicating the sanctity of a religious symbol would be recording it faithfully, particularly if the symbol served a magical or epitropaic purpose, as in fact is known to be the case with sun ages, which are featured prominently on amulets throughout the ancient world. Moreover, it is common to find solar petroglyphs upon the same rock face with images of animals and people, the latter drawn in relatively realistic fashion. Why then need we invoke subjective factors to explain the solar petroglyphs? There is a very simple answer to this question. It is simply unthinkable to consider the logic alternative that the petroglyphs faithfully depict the ancient sun, albeit one radically different in appearance from the current solar orb. This is not to deny the possibility that sacred images become more abstract through time. Certainly representations of the ancient sun god became more anthropomorphic that's the second time I've come across that word in the last two days. As civilization progressed, the question before us is not whether religious images are subject to evolution and transmutation. Rather, why prehistoric images of the sun do not conform with its current appearance? If one is willing to entertain the possibility that prehistoric rock art is representative in nature, how is it possible to discover the celestial phenomenon behind the various sun images? In so much as writing did not yet exist at the time most of these images were created. Oops! <laughs> it would appear that we have reached a dead end in our investigation. Religious beliefs, however, are notoriously conservative in nature. Indeed they are. And thus it may be possible to trace our solar forms. Should this prove to be the case, we might gain therefrom some insight into the original significance of the prehistoric images. With this strategy in mind, we turn to consider the iconographical evidence from the ancient Near East, where we will find that strikingly similar images appear amongst the earliest art in writing. All right. All right. Well, you get the gist. The most common symbol for Shamash, I Shamash the ball, and everybody goes, rah. The most common symbol for Shamash is known in figure six, a test already in Cadian times. In most cases, the image features the circular disc. And yesterday, when I said that the planets were in the sun's uh, magnetic sphere, I, I meant its magnetic disk. And they're both repelling each other. And uh, mutual, so it would fit where its repelling, you know, was at a minimum. And the, there's slots for each planet according to how much charge they have. Patient reference to the, uh, that's what I think anyway. I mean, I could be all wet. I don't, I don't know, but that's what I think it is. A crescent, the particular symbol may appear alone, or more commonly, alongside a crescent and a star. A patent reference to the intimate relationship believed to exist between Shamash, Sin, and Ishtar, the divine triad of ancient Babylon. Although the crescent of sin is readily unquestionable, given the gods' customary identification with the moon, why the ancient Babylons would have represented the sun with this particular symbol is difficult to explain. The same image, moreover, is frequently found perched atop a pillar-like structure, raising further questions as to the objective basis of the image. Remembering the pillar-like appendage associated with early sun images in prehistoric rock art, one can't help but wonder whether it the doggone thing just don't want to keep playing.
Tschüss.
Last one. I had to humor me. Still in 
Figure 1, energy, electric field strength, and charge density as a function of radial distance from the sun's surface. The energy plot shown above in the photo is valid for positively charged particles because a positive E field represents an outward radial force toward the right per unit charge on any such particle. The region wherein the E field is negative A to B constitutes an inward force. This region of the lower photosphere is thus an energy barrier. The positive ions must surmount in order to escape the body of the sun. Any ions attempting to escape outward from within the sun must have enough energy to get over this energy barrier. So the presence of this single positive charge layer at the bottom of the photospheric plasma serves as a constraint on unlimited escape of ions in the surface of the sun. Granule shrinkage and movement. In order to visualize the effect this energy diagram has on electron, negative charges coming in toward the sun from cosmic space from the right we can turn the energy plot upside down. Doing this enables us to visualize the trap that these photospheric granules are for incoming electrons. As the trap fills, the energy of the granule existing between B and C decreases in height, and so the granule weakens, shrinks, and eventually disappears. This is the cause of the observed shrinkage and disappearance of the photospheric granules. Temperature minimum. If the standard model were correct, heat and light would simply radiate away from the photosphere, as from a hot stove. Temperature measurements would monotonically decrease with distance. But many processes, other than simple radiation of heat, are occurring above the photosphere. A temperature minimum of about 4100 Kelvin occurs just above the photosphere, the lower region of the sun's corona at much higher altitude, are millions of degrees hotter than the surface of the sun itself. How can this be? The standard model has no satisfactory explanation. The electric sun hypothesis explains it clearly as follows. Charged particles do not experience external electrostatic forces when they are in the range B to C, within the photosphere. Only random thermal movement occurs due to diffusion. Temperature is simply the measurement of the violence of such random movement. This is where the about 6,000 Kelvin photospheric temperature is measured. Positive ions have their maximum electrical potential energy when they are in this photospheric granule plasma, but their mechanical kinetic energy is relatively low. At a point just to the left of point C, any random movement toward the right Radially outward, upward. Its magnetic field is weakening, but it's not about to reverse. We owe our existence to the Earth's magnetic field, the invisible barrier that protects the planet from the harsh radiation of space. But this shield is far from static and tends to wane and even reverse at semi irregular intervals. With the magnetic field currently weakening, there's been a lot of talk in recent years that another flip might be imminent. But a new study has looked at the history of these events and found that a reversal probably isn't about to happen. I think it's reset itself a couple of times, but the mainstreamers, they can't make up their minds. I'll continue. The cause for concern starts with what's known as the South Atlantic Anomaly. SAA. In this area, stretching across the Atlantic Ocean from Chile to Zimbabwe, the magnetic field is substantially weaker than elsewhere in the world. Ever since this region was discovered in 1958, it's been growing as part of an overall weakening of the entire magnetic field over the last few centuries. The end result of that trend appears to be the reversal of the poles. Historically, Magnetic north and south switch places every 200 to 300,000 years, and we're actually well overdue for such an event. It's been about 780,000 years since the last one. Although doomsayers <coughs> love to shout about how a pole reversal would rain down hellish amounts of radiation onto Earth. 
NASA says that our biggest concern would just be buying new compasses. But how likely is that scenario, anyway? To find out, researchers from the University of Liverpool, home of the Beatles, GFZ, German Research Center, Du hast mich. for geosciences, and the University of Iceland, looked to past fluctuations in the field. A weakening magnetic field doesn't always mean that the poles are about to reverse. More often than that, the field recovered its original structure, and this waning recovering event is known as geomagnetic excursion. There you see the magnetic field at the surface and the radial field of the cosmic microwave background. During the last two excursions, the Les Champ top and Mono Lake bottom events, University of Liverpool. The researchers modeled the geomagnetic field between 30,000 and 50,000 years ago. Their aim was to examine the two most recent geomagnetic excursions. The Le Champ, which occurred about 41,000 years ago, and the Mono Lake, which occurred about 34,000 years ago, team found that the magnetic field at those times looked nothing like it does today, indicating that the current changes aren't where signs of any impending excursion or reversal, indicating that the current changes aren't warning signs of any impending excursion or reversal. Now, that's interesting. Uh, 30 to 50,000 years ago, one says 41,034. I'm thinking that, you know, the Earth's magnetic field had to get, the Earth had to get magnetized. And Dr. Velikovsky claims in Earth and Upheaval that the mountainous, the rocks in certain mountainous regions are 100 times more magnetic than the Earth's field. And that kind of, to me, says that there was once a giant body charging the earth the only way it's going to go up is if it gets uh, another one of them charging situations so i don't think this planet was meant to go around a yellow dwarf g-class star like the sun was meant to go around a brown or a red dwarf that could explain why we're the insects are dying now fish are dying in the millions i, mean, I don't want to, you know i don't know but it's possible i mean with the cosmic rays coming in the atmosphere could change and next thing you know phases out one kind of life and paves the way for the next it's just some surmising from me i mean it's not a total stab in the dark it kind of has reasoning um there has been speculation that we are about to experience a magnetic polar reversal or excursion, says Richard Holm, co-author of the study. However, by studying the two most recent excursion events, we show that neither bear resemblance to current changes in the geomagnetic field, and therefore it is probably unlikely that such an event is about to happen. Our research suggests instead that the current weakening field will recover without such an extreme event and therefore is unlikely to reverse. Well, I don't know about recovering. I think the magnetic field of the Earth probably has a lot to do with the sun cycles. We shall soon see. But I suppose we'll, we'll get to thunderbolts in a bit here. To back up, the team also found two periods where the field structure was most similar to how it is today. 49,000 and 46,000 years ago. Okay. I assume they're going by the uh, little readings in the rocks. The field at these times had anomalies similar to, but much stronger than, that over the South Atlantic today and yet neither developed into anything. Studies of chlorine and beryllium isotopes indicate that more cosmic radiation was indeed reaching the surface 46,000 years ago. The results of, as well as other similar studies, should help allay any fears of an impending polar reversal. Not only is it not likely to happen anytime soon, but even if it did, we don't have anything to worry about because they say so. <laughs> And Janelle Cook says that the Earth will never turn over. It's impossible. That's just his opinion, but I like that. A lot of Earth turning over do much for me. Let's see. And this is from the National Academy of the Sciences. All right. And then let's take a look at Thunderbolts Group. <laughs> Top 
ties that bind. Earth and the Sun are joined together. The four magnetospheric multiscale satellites, MMS, were launched March 12, 2015, on a mission to study the magnetic field around the Earth, especially what scientists like to call magnetic reconnection. According to the theory, when magnetic field lines cross and reconnect through some unknown mechanism, they are supposed to detonate, releasing large quantities of heat light and electrical energy. The fatal flaws in magnetic reconnection theory are not the topic of this paper. Suffice to say that magnetic field lines are merely representations that are no more capable of detonation than lines of longitude are. The MMS piggybacks on the time mission that was launched in 2001. The thermosphere, ionosphere, mesosphere, energetic energetics and dynamic spacecraft is currently in orbit analyzing solar influences on the earth especially the mesosphere and lower thermosphere ionosphere a region near 60 to 180 kilometers in altitude the highest levels of the atmosphere are not well are not are not well understood especially the thermosphere where the sun where the sun's energy begins to interact with atmospheric particles. Just how this relationship works continues to be investigated. However, time detected a tenfold decline in the thermosphere's temperature since 2002. Time measured the amount of ultraviolet light from the sun, finding a significant decrease since the start of the solar minimum. The amount of infrared radiation emitted by nitric oxide molecules also declined, the sun implying that the upper atmosphere cooled over the course of solar minimum. Temperatures in the thermosphere are dependent on solar radiation. Extreme ultraviolet light is absorbed by the residual oxygen and becomes electrically charged with increasing molecular motion. Fast molecular motion is known as heat. So even though a household thermometer would register temperatures below zero in the thermosphere, it is considered hot, sometimes reaching over 1500 degrees Celsius during solar maximum. The MMS constellation as well as others scheduled for launch before the end of the decade, the Geospace Electrodynamic Connections mission and the, the Magnetospheric Constellation missions are part of a widespread international consortium known as Global Electric Circuit Project. We will do this through development of improved understanding and processes controlling the charge and discharge of electrified clouds. The electrical coupling between the atmosphere and ionosphere and the flow of current throughout the system. The 22-year solar cycle is now known to energize Earth's climate. Earth's environment is part of a circuit in the solar system with the sun as the primary electrode, although the solar energy varies over time, corresponding with, solar, with sunspot cycles. Well, you increase the electricity and you increase the magnetosphere. That variance amounts to less than one-tenth of one percent. Electricity from space is injected into the thermosphere from charged particles emitted by the sun, otherwise called solar wind, speeding along massive Birkeland currents through a closed circuit. When solar winds are at a minimum, the electric currents decline in amperage, thereby decreasing the strength of the Earth's magnetosphere. There you have it. It's controlled by the sun. As the magnetosphere declines in strength, it is less able to deflect energetic ions arriving from deep space, known as cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are charge carriers, and those ions are able to reach the troposphere. Collisions between charge and neutral particles drag air molecules along with them, influencing low-level cloud cover. More clouds reflect more radiation from the sun back to space. Clouds are white because they are acting like mirrors to all forms of visible light. More reflection means less solar energy. More cloud cover and so on. Solar maximum is now considered to be over, and the sun is returning to a more passive state. Correspondence between the sun's electric field strength, cosmic rays, the Earth's magnetosphere, cloud cover, and climate are continuing to be investigated. Electric Universe advocates expect further confirmation of the connection. Stephen Smith
Okay, I'm gonna come on and say hello there. <clears throat> like I said, I would. I got to make this screen tiny and come here to the, the good screen and get you on the capture. There you are. And there we go. All right. We're just getting somewhere. 56. Okay, that means I got to keep going. It's looking good. Three hours, four minutes, and all is well. I want to say hello to everyone. For you are not forsaken. Gerald Wagster, good to still see you here. If someone can hang for the whole entire stream, you get a gold star. I already got two gold stars. Adusa. And... Oh my gosh. Help me, Adusa. Who is it? Who's the other dude? I, I'm drawing a blank. I, I just, it's one of the things, you know, you, get, you can't do it. Supernatural Trooper. Hi. Gerald Blackster. Valerie McBrayer. Supernatural. Roy Rush Trooper. Alchemy, there you are. You've been here since the beginning, so you might be getting in line gold star. And, you know, we'll, we'll make a little, like, shrine on the Discord channel. <laughs> I think, uh, Gerald, uh, you guys are really chatting it up. Charlie, Valerie, that's good. I like to see that. It means you're enjoying yourself. That's what it's all about. You here, Nick? Are you with me? I had someone who talked in stereotypes. Go to court. Oh, the woman must be the one who's right. The guy's just a, you know, a deadbeat dad. Or I mean, that's just what they think. They're so freaking, it's unbelievable. Our court system, unbelievable. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to start playing. I'll, uh, I'll have to listen to this rant. See if I'll keep it. I'm going to put something on for you. I'll be back. Uh, does anybody have anything? I'll be back. Just, I'm going to... Oh, I got the uh, Rings of Saturn. That's right. See, I kind of lost my th train of thought there. Just talking to you. But it, like I said, I want to incorporate the peanut gallery more because I like, you know, that your thoughts. You have good thoughts and it, it, it helps the conversation instead of just me talking by myself. I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I have to remember that. When I say something now... I think it's taken you like 20 seconds to hear it, so you're always 20 seconds behind me. Yeah, I just, we just need to have more, like, I mean, we've been in the world with Russia for over 100 years now. They don't have the same system we do, but don't you think it'd be smart if we just made friends with them? I mean, really, what's the problem? They got over the commie rat thing a long time ago. But now it's just like, you know, we're still hostile to them. It just doesn't make any sense. It's absolutely asinine. But yet they do it. <laughs> okay, we're going to watch the Rings of Saturn. One instance of the Saturn myth that can be verified, with the help of a small telescope, Saturn is in chains. Instead of solving anything, this fact has created a problem. Demands a solution. How did the ancient Greeks and Romans know that Saturn is encircled by ring? It is strange that this question was not asked before. The existence of these rings around Saturn became known in modern times only in the 17th century, after the telescope was invented. They were first seen, but misunderstood by Galileo and understood by Huygens. If the myth did not by mere chance invent these rings, the Greeks must have seen them. The last case could be true. If the Greeks or some other oriental people possessed lenses adapted for the observation of celestial bodies, 
or if the rings around Saturn were visible to the naked eye at some time in the past. Today they are not visible without magnifying instruments. There are cases of exact observations by the Chaldeans which suggest the use of some accurate technical means. These means could consist of a sort of astrolabe like that of Tycho de Brahe, who made most accurate observations of celestial bodies without the help of a telescope. Also, Copernicus, prior to Tycho de Brahe, made all his it's calculations of the movements of the planets before the telescope was invented, but neither Tycho de Brahe nor Copernicus saw the ring. The statue of Saturn on the Roman capital had bands around its feet, and Macrobius, in the 5th century of our era, already ignorant of the meaning of these bands, asked, but why is the god Saturn in chains? In the Egyptian legend, Isis, Jupiter, swathes Osiris. Saturn. The Egyptian appellative for Osiris was the swath. In the Zend Vesta it is said that the star history Jupiter later oh, Venus man. keeps Perico in twofold bonds. Saturn is encircled by two groups of Hello. rings, one larger and one smaller, with a space in between. To see this, a better telescope than that okay. used by Galileo Galilei or that used by Huygens is needed. The twofold structure of the girdle was first observed in 1675. The rings of Saturn were known also to the Aborigines of America before Columbus discovered the land. This means also right, before we'll the over, telescope we'll was invented at the beginning of the 17th century. Okay. An ancient engraved wooden panel from Mexico shows the family of planets. One of them is Saturn, easily recognizable by its ring. Nor were the Maoris of New Zealand ignorant of it. One of the great mysteries connected with Saturn is the still unanswered question of how the ancient Maoris of New Zealand knew about her rings, for there is evidence that they did have a Saturnian ring legend long before the days of Galileo. In the myth, it is said that Jupiter drove Saturn away and that on this occasion Saturn was put in chains. If these words mean what they say and are not a meaningless portion of the myths, in a dream at least there are no meaningless parts, then the knowledge of the ancients about the rings of Saturn could have been acquired because of better visibility. A great in other expulsion. Words, at some time in the past, Saturn and Earth appear to have been closer to one another. Originally, I assumed that the rings of Saturn may consist of water in the form of ice. But since the ancient lore all around the world tells that it was Jupiter that put these rings around Saturn, I considered that they might have some other components too. Since the 1960s, spectroscopic study of the Saturnian rings has confirmed that they consist mostly of water in the form of ice. The rings of Saturn are referred to by Aeschylus Eumenides, 641. He, Zeus, himself cast into bonds his aged father Cronus. Moreover, it is not true, neither, that Saturn is in chain. Neoplatonists like Proclus and Tamayo by Festigere sought a philosophical or mystical meaning in the tradition also, and yet the king of the gods, the first and eldest one, is in bonds, and they say, if we are to believe Hesiod and Homer and the other wise men who tell this tale about Kronos, Augustine refuting those who asserted that the Jewish Sabbath was held in honor of Saturn wrote a bunch of stuff in Latin. <laughs> Eta paters nostri launch fuera de Saturnises patinus, quam vis pro tempore profiatuis abati vacation evot of Averant. Contrafaust to Manichium XX 13. These chains with their double fetter, Zoilius dedicates to you, Saturnus. The shrines to Saturn in Roman Africa portrayed the god with his head surrounded by a veil that falls on each of his shoulders, in a way reminiscent to the planet's rings. Ancient yeah. knowledge of Jupiter's bands and Saturn's rings. <coughs> Classical journal. Yeah. And then we got, uh, ancient knowledge of Jupiter's bands and Saturn's rings. 
Chronos 2, 3, 1977. When Galileo first saw the rings in July of 1610, he thought them to be two satellites on either side of Saturn. And this is what he also announced in his Sidereus Nuncius, the planet Saturn, A. Alexander, 1962. Huygens System of Saturnium, 1659. Saturn too is represented with his feet bound together, and although Ferius Flaccus says that he does not know the reason, Apollodorus says that throughout the year Saturn is bound with a bond of wool that is set free on the day of his festival. The Osiris cult and the designation of Osiris idols in the Bible. The Zen de Vesta, Tristria, the bright star, keeps Perioco in twofold bonds and threefold bonds. A third ring around Saturn was observed in 1980. Velikovsky also thought that mythic representations of Kronos with his body encircled by a snake may attest to a memory of the rings of Saturn. The planet Saturn shown in an ancient woodcut reproduced in F. Maurice, London, 1800, Volume 7, and described by the author as encircled with a ring formed of serpents. Tammuz, who represented the planet Saturn in Babylonia, was called He Who Is Bound. Ninib, who was also Saturn, was said to hold the unbreakable bond. The observation was made by G. D. Cassini. Regarding the process of formation of Saturn's rings, Velikovsky thought it might have been analogous to the formation of a disk like ring of gaseous material around some stars in, 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 in binary systems, as described by H. Friedman in Science 181. Gas enters into a Keplerian orbits and accumulates in a disk somewhat resembling Saturn's rings. In August 1965, Tobias Owen, writing in Science, reported that the reflection spectrum from the ice block gave the best match to the absorption observed in Saturn's rings, but that the most likely alternatives would be ices of methane and ammonia, both known ingredients of the Jovian atmosphere, methane being also in the composition of the Saturnian cloud envelope. As early as 1947, Kuiper, the atmospheres of the Earth and planets, 1949 concluded in the basis of spectral measurements in the infrared that the rings are covered in frost, if not composed of ice. Saturn's rings, although H2O is a major constituent, the spectra reflectivity indicates the presence of other materials. Astronomers had long been aware that there would be an alignment of the planets on March 10, 1982, where Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto would be on the same side of the Sun, within an arc 95 degrees wide. But no effect could be expected, as the tidal forces of the other planets affecting the Earth's crust are negligible, even at the planet's closest approach. In the book The Jupiter Effect, the authors sought to partially sidestep objections by considering the effect of the alignment on the Sun, and hence on the solar wind, which in turn is known to affect weather on the Earth. Atmospheric conditions on Earth can alter the speed of its rotation. The effect on the Sun would also be quite small. However, and in fact, there had been an even closer alignment in the year 1128 without any incident. There was some influence by the planets mentioned above, with the high tides calculated as being about 40 micrometers higher than normal. In April 1982, Gribben and Plagman published a lesser-selling book, The Jupiter Effect Reconsidered.
and had they theorized that the effect had actually taken place in 1980. Despite the lack of planetary alignment then, and that it had triggered the volcanic eruption of Mount St. Helens. Every once in a while, something like this pops up. Millions of people will eat it up, and it will turn out to be nothing. The ten notable apocalypses that obviously didn't happen. In 1974, John Griffith and Stephen Plackman wrote a best-selling book, The Jupiter Effect. That the key word there is best-selling book. I wouldn't doubt it for a minute if earthquakes and volcanoes weren't electric. Everything is electric. But there was that third ring on Saturn in 1980. The Arrival of the Waters Following the seven days when the world appeared to be ablaze in the radiance of a thousand suns, the deluge started. First, according to the Hindu account, vast clouds gathered which overshadowed the entire world. These ominous clouds rumbling, shooting lightning, overspread the sky. They were as vast mountains. Some were dusky, some crimson, some white, some brilliant in hue. Other sources describe them as yellow or azure or red. Loud in roar and mighty in size, they fill the entire sky. They were friends with lightning and meteors and thunderbolts. Then, Rumbling aloud with lights, they poured torrential streams, thick like chariot wheels. They rained with a sullen roar, inundating the three worlds, ceaseless downpour of torrents. And then there were seen on all sides the four oceans, engulfing with tempestuous waves the whole surface of the earth. All creation was smit by the luminous, dense floods. In the beginning of the deluge, the nova in the sky shone through the splendor of the illuminated skies and through the sheets of rain, ever increasing in intensity. The biblical expression, the Lord sitteth upon the flood, was an apt description of the blazing nova above the waters of the deluge. It has a Babylonian counterpart in the title of Tammuz as Belgersu, Lord of the Flood. The nova blazed terrifically, but soon the light became diffused. The shadows grew ever dimmer. The world that was all splendor and light turned gloomier and gloomier. The outpouring waters grew ever thicker. The clouds of dust darkened ever more the sky. And finally, the drama that was taking place on Earth went on in darkness. The deluge was not a peaceful, though abundant rain, filling the earth with water, rising ever higher. Ancient sources give a description of the deluge that differs greatly from the pageant of showers pouring from above on peaceful land and peaceful sea. Skandapurala in S. Shastri. The flood legend in Sanskrit literature. The Babylon expression in the wailings for Tammuz, the shining ocean to thy perditions has taken the Babylonian liturgies, Paris, 1913. Let's see if I have an end screen. Huh, I bet I don't. Let's see. Should be showing up right now. Nope. They like to take my end screens from me. Yeah. That it. And end screen boom and that looks good boom 
and you know I'll come back and it'll be off again <laughs> crazy all right well you know it's just part of the game I guess so um, I'm gonna come out there see you gotta get it right I can't be having wrong screens and stuff gotta make sure I don't do that because I'm good at doing that <laughs> All right, now I got a little problem here with the. There we go. All right, come out and talk to you. Hey, uh, you guys here? You guys, uh, Hadusa? That was good, wasn't it? I enjoyed that. It's been a while since I saw it. Um, we have the same group. You guys are still hanging out. Oh, yes. Alchemy's hanging out. It's not going to be much longer. Grouch, Adusa, are you guys there? Did you fall asleep? <laughs> Jasper, how you doing? It's good to see all of you. It really is. I love that number 62 over there. That's, that's beautiful. Reminds me of 1962. Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> uh... It might be, it might have been, Nick, come on, talk to me on Discord. Do you want to chat a little bit, or do you want me to just go on and do a video? I, I was kind of hoping we could chat. Man, I don't want to. Yes, yeah, sure, all of a sudden. Uh, Greg, yeah, if it's yeah. all right with everybody, I don't mind. Uh... Oh, yeah, I think people enjoy that banter, you know, get points of view. What do you think, uh, uh, you know, does isn't it kind of, almost overwhelmingly conclusive that the Earth and Saturn were connected at some point? Yes, yeah, sir. It's, it has so much evidence in its favor that it's just overwhelming. It's like embarrassingly rich to coin, uh, to use the phrase that e. F. Cochran coined. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, it truly is. It's amazing. I mean, the Big Bang doesn't have anything on Saturn theory, especially when things start to match up, you know, like the water and the air and all that. That's hard. That's kind of scientific data there. That kind of takes it over the theory stage. What do you think? You, or you don't? That much, huh? What's wrong? Are you, are you having t technical difficulties? Medusa. See, we got Grouch in here from Australia, Medusa from jolly old England, and Greg from the U.S. And it would be perfect if we could all talk, but something's going on. Medusa, are you there? I think he just got knocked out. And Grouch, I think he's knocked out too. Okay, fine. I'll play a video. Maybe they'll come back. Let's see, they're 12 hours ahead of me. So, it's quarter to six in the morning here. So, it's like seven o'clock at night on that side of the world. Hmm. That's a good time. That's prime time. You know. All right, I'm gonna play. Uh, we'll we'll do some more Saturn stuff. That was kind of fun. I enjoyed that. All right. Greg, I'll get back to you in thirty minutes. The worship of Saturn, Saturn so active in cosmic changes, was regarded by all mankind as the supreme god. Seneca says that Epigenes, who studied astronomy among the Chaldeans, estimates that the planet Saturn exerts the greatest influence upon all the movements of the celestial bodies. On becoming a nova, 
It ejected filaments in all directions, and the solar system became illuminated as if by a hundred suns. It subsided rather quickly and retreated into faraway regions. Peoples that remembered early tragedies enacted in the sky by the heavenly bodies asserted that Jupiter drove Saturn away from its place in the sky. Before Jupiter, Zeus became the chief god. Saturn, Kronos, occupied the celestial throne. In all ancient religions, the dominion passes from Saturn to Jupiter. In Greek mythology, Kronos is presented as the father and Zeus as his son who dethrones him. Kronos devours some of his children. After this act, Zeus overpowers his father, puts him in chains, and drives him from his royal station in the sky. If Egyptian folklore or religion, the participants of the drama are said to be Osiris Saturn, brother and husband of Isis Jupiter. The cult of Osiris and the mysteries associated with it dominated the Egyptian religion as nothing else. Every dead man or woman was entombed with observances honoring Osiris. The city of Abydos in the desert west of the Nile and northwest of Thebes was sacred to him. Sais in the delta, used to commemorate the floating of Osiris' body carried by the Nile into the Mediterranean, what made Osiris so deeply ingrained in the religious memory of the nation that his cult pervaded mythology and religion. Osiris' dominion before his murder by Seth was remembered as a time of bliss. According to the legend, Seth, Osiris's brother, killed and dismembered him. Whereupon Isis, Osiris' wife, went on peregrinations, peregrinations to collect his dispersed members. Having gathered them and wrapped them together with swathings, she brought Osiris back to life. The memory of this event was a matter of yearly jubilation among the Egyptians. Osiris became lord of the netherworld and land of the dead, the land of the dead, a legend, a prominent part of the Osiris cycle tells that Isis gave birth to Horus, whom she conceived from the already dead Osiris, and that Horus grew up to avenge his father by engaging Seth in mortal combat. In Egyptology, the meaning of these occurrences stands as an unresolved mystery. The myth of Osiris is too remarkable and occurs in too many divergent forms, not to contain a considerable element of historic truth, wrote Sir Alan Gardner, the leading scholar in these fields. I wonder if that's Lawrence Gardner's dad. I bet he's related. But what historical truth is it? Could it be of an ancient king upon whose tragic death the entire legend hinged? Wondered Gardner. But of such a king... Not a trace has been found before the time of the pyramid texts. And in these texts, Osiris is spoken of without end. There he appears as a dead god or a king or judge of the dead. But who was Osiris in real life? asked Gardner. At times, he is represented to us as the vegetation which perishes in the floodwater mysteriously issuing from himself. He is associated with brilliant light. After the life of studying Egyptian history and religion, Gardner confessed that he remained unaware of whom Osiris represented or memorialized. The origin of Osiris remains for me as insoluble mystery, nor could others in this field help him find the answer. The, Egypt, the Egyptologist John Wilson wrote that it is an admission of failure that the chief cultural content of Egyptian civilization, its religion, its mythological features, again and again narrated and alluded to in the text and represented in statues and 
temple reliefs is not understood. The astral meaning of Egyptian deities was not realized and the cosmic events of their activities represent were not thought of. The prophet Ezekiel in the Babylon exile had a vision, the likeness of a man, but made of fire and amber, who lifted him by the lock of his hair and brought him to some darkened chamber where the ancients of the house of Israel, with censers in their hands, were worshipping idols portrayed upon the wall round about. Then the angel of the vision told him, Thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought the prophet to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Next he showed him also Jews in the inner court of the Lord's house, with their back toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, that they worshipped the sun toward the east. The worship of the sun and the planets was decried by Jeremiah, a contemporary of Ezekiel. But what was this weeping for Tammuz? Tammuz was a Babylonian god. One of the months of the year, approximately coinciding with July, in the summer, was named in his honor. And by this very name, it is known in the present-day Hebrew calendar, Tammuz, was the god that died and was then hidden in the underworld. His death was the reason for a fast, accompanied by lamentations of the women of the land. His finding or his return to life in resurrection were the motifs of the passion. Tammuz was the god of vegetation, of the flood, and of seeds. The god Tammuz came from Armenia every year in his ark in the overflowing river, blessing the alluvium with new growth. In the month of Tammuz he was bound, and the liturgies speak of his having been drowned among flowers, which were thrown upon him as he sank beneath the waves of the Euphrates. The drowning of Tammuz was an occasion for wailing by women. The flood has taken Tammuz. The raging storm has brought him low. Of Tammuz, it is also narrated that he was associated with brilliant light, with descent into the netherworld, visited by Ishtar, his spouse. Tammuz's death, his subsequent resurrection, or his discovery in the far reaches, but no longer brilliant, were the themes of the cult that was not just one of the mysteries, but the chief and paramount cult. The Osirian mysteries, the wailing for Tammuz, all refer to the transformation of Saturn during and following the deluge. Osiris was not a king, but the planet Saturn, Kronos of the Greeks, Tammuz of the Babylonians. The Babylonians called Saturn the star of Tammuz. After the deluge, Saturn was invisible. The sky was covered for a long time by clouds of volcanic dust. And the Egyptians cried for Osiris, and the Babylonians cried for Tammuz. Isis, Jupiter at that time, went in search of her husband and Ishtar, also Jupiter at that early time, went to the netherworld to find her husband Tammuz. For a time Saturn disappeared, driven away by Jupiter, and when it reappeared, it was no longer the same planet. It moved very slowly. The disappearance of the planet Saturn in the netherworld became the theme of many religious observances, compromising liturgies, mystery plays, lamentations, and fasts. When Osiris was seen again in the sky, though greatly diminished, the people were frenzied by the return of Osiris from death. Nevertheless, he became king of the netherworld. In the Egyptian way of seeing the celestial drama, Isis, Jupiter, the spouse of Osiris, Saturn, wrapped him in swathings, Osiris was known as the Swath, the way the dead came to be dressed for their journey to the world of the dead, over which Osiris reigns, 
similar rites were celebrated in honor of Adonis, who died and was resurrected after a stay in the Netherland. In the Mysteries of Orpheus Sir James G. Fraser, a collector of folklore, came to regard Osiris as a vegetation god. Likewise, he saw in the Babylonian Tammuz an equivalent of the Egyptian Osiris, a vegetation god, and carried away by this concept, wrote his, the golden bow, built around the idea of the vegetation god that dies and is resurrected the following year. A few peoples, through consecutive planetary ages, kept fidelity to the ancient Saturn, or Kronos, or Brahma, whose age was previous to that of Jupiter. Thus the Scythians were called Uman Manda by the Chaldeans, people of Manda, and Manda is the name of Saturn. The Phoenicians regarded El Saturn as their chief deity. Isubius informs us that El, a name used also in the Bible as a name for God, was the name of Saturn. In Persia, Saturn was known as Kevan or Kavan. The different names for God in the Bible reflect the process of going through many ages in which one planet superseded another and was again superseded by the next one in the celestial war. El was the name of Saturn, Adonis of the Syrians. The bewailed deity was also like Osiris, the planet Saturn. But in the period of the contest between the two major planets, Jupiter and Saturn, the appellative of the dual gods became Adonai, which means my lords. Then, with the victory of Jupiter, it came to be applied to him alone. Emanuel Velikovsky You know, I realized that uh, I have my daughter this weekend, and she just got up, which means that I have to take care of her get her breakfast, and get the day going. I will try to log back, <clears throat> you know, after a while, when I get a break, if I'm not too tired. <laughs> but I, I uh, let's see, I'm going to go to our screen here. And Alchemy gets a gold star. All right. Was anybody else here? Let me get you on... Uh, screen so that's cool it, it takes a, tr a real trooper to hang out though for the whole broadcast this is a short one but it, I know supernatural troopers been here for a while Jasper's been here yeah I wanted to keep going but my, I can't I, I can't be rude to my I got you know, it's daddy thing. So, I have to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, thank you for watching. And I will be back next weekend. And you never know. I might surprise you. I might come back because I wanted to chat with Adusa and with uh, Grouch. So I, I'm going to try to come back for that. But I'm going to close this down. Thank you for watching and try to support the channel any way you can thank you good night love yous gold star for alchemy <laughs>